Hello guys, how are you? Welcome to the second week of this course. First of all, I want to start by thanking you for being so attentive um, to the week number one. Um, I, I received most of the of the assignments already. I am doing this video in advance uh, before the deadline, um, but uh, hopefully everybody will be able to meet it because I, I have seen uh, most of them already. Um, I also want to mention that I really do not have a lot of observations. Um, maybe a couple in terms of the enunciates, especially the third part. Some of them, uh, I mean, some of the um, assignments have certain doubts in there, like certain things that are not exactly right. But do not worry, I am going to uh, finish revising uh, the, the final ones that I received. And if necessary, I will create a post clarifying that, or maybe um, another video. Anyway, please check the comments. Uh, I uh, I revised many of them and, and already added the comments, so it may be may be good that you revise them to clarify certain things if necessary. Okay. Well, guys, as usual, I would like to start uh, with uh, sharing with you a poem. I think that this might be nice, uh, taking into account our condition of isolation. Um, this was written by um, Carlos Palacio, who is um, a Colombian writer, singer, composer, sonatist. He's a really, uh, you know, proficient guy in terms of writing, and and he has really nice music and really nice uh, poems. Uh, this one's called. Uh, Cuando te vuelva a ver, uh, I usually like sort of uh, like to read as possible as I can uh, uh, the, the the works in their in their original language. So here it goes. Um, and well, I consider that it is nice because somehow some of you, some of us, have been in that condition of wanting to see a, a, wanting to see a person, uh, but for any reason we are not able to because they are far away or because uh, they uh, just are unable to uh, to see uh, to see us for some reason and I think that revisiting this poem under this condition of uh, isolation uh, might be really nice maybe some of you can connect with some of the feelings so as I mentioned it is called Cuando te vuelva a ver Cuando te vuelva a ver yo seré otro resulta imperativo que lo sepas tú esperando al metódico, al cantante al que los jesuitas moldearon, al cortés, al paciente, al que aprendió a tratar a las señoritas como a los libros caros, como a los cuadros caros, como a las colecciones de pinceles, o al cristal de bohemia, o al durazno. Te podrías llevar una sorpresa. No digo que el planeta se derrumbe, que yo seré otro, y es preciso que lo sepas, que sepas, que tengas el casco, que te blindes. Cuando te vuelva a ver, no esperes prólogos, me lanzaré a tu boca sin preguntas, sin consideraciones ni poemas, como el suicida al tren, el toro al ruedo, como se lanza el sexo el sordomudo, y plantaré mi beso cual bandera, como afiche de fiesta o de concierto, como se siembra un cactus, brutalmente. Y solo luego del trueno y la estampida, después de que los labios se reciten y se cierran los ojos y se abran, solo entonces, no antes, te diré, buena tarde, ¿qué te tomas? ¿Cómo estuvo tu día? ¿Caminamos? So, well, I think that this is uh, really nice. I, it, it, it's a poem that I have always liked. Um, but uh, these days I, I think it, it sort of changes a little bit the meaning because the, the situation somehow is adjusted to it in a, in a more uh, adequate way. Okay? Well, I hope you have enjoyed that. Uh, some of you at least. And... Um, there we go, so I will appreciate if you can go to the slide number 27 and we are going to be discussing about uh, the oral discourse. Oh, a little little pause in there, uh, remember that uh, I gave an assignment, I explained how to do it on, on, on week number one, but it is on, uh, I mean it is due for the week number two, remember that it is for uh, working in pairs. Uh, well, working in groups, not in pairs, and uh, well, hopefully I will be publishing the assignment before this video. Uh, so do not forget to do that, okay? Because it really belongs to the, let's say, to the concept of the week number one. 
So uh, we were defining different things in the last week. Uh, we talked about the definition of this course, the units of analysis, the components, all of that. Hopefully, all of that is clear. Also about the enunciates and the texts. Um, so now that we know that in, in general terms, um, what we are going to do is to uh, subdivide this discourse into two very big groups the oral discourse and the written discourse so let's go with the oral discourse right now uh, for reasons of let's say antiquity if you want to call it uh, I strongly believe that the oral discourse preceded the written one um, there are different proof of that and there are different ways in which we can say that most likely it came historically first um, and, and that is why and, and also because we use it uh, most of the time even if we don't know how to read or write right so I, I think that that is why we can go with it first and explore it a little bit um, in order to get to know some of its uh, features okay so if you go to that slide you will see here uh, a quote by Confucius uh, right it says uh, I wish not to speak does the sky ever speak the four seasons follow their course and a hundred beings are born does the sky ever speak so analyze that you have to try to understand what does he mean by that yes what is he trying to say what do you what do you imagine that uh, he's is trying to uh, like to transmit take a minute for that so um, basically he is diminishing somehow the importance of the speaking yes uh, he has this profound uh, feeling or desire uh, of of not wanting really to speak because what can you say that is more eloquent uh, than nature that is more eloquent than uh, real life or day to day life yes it says does the sky ever speak so he's, he's thinking about the clouds thinking about the the astral uh, let's say projections that we're able to see or grasp uh, and they are so grand right they are so magnificent but they don't even need to speak, you know, the way of, of the sky uh, of speaking is uh, uh, raining or uh, maybe uh, producing winds or uh, combining with the sun and, you know, providing us with a very nice sunset or whatever, right? So it seems that if something, if something that is so grand and so nice uh, doesn't require speak so why would us right us that are so insignificant in the in the big scale of things it says the four seasons follow their curse and a hundred beings are born so winter and spring and summer and everything come and go and beings animals humans and plants they are born and they never speak yes and even they are the ones who are more permanent somehow in on earth right uh, so this is a really interesting and nice philosophical uh, discussion or reflection, let's say, about the uh, lack of importance of orality. Yes, why should we ever speak? It seems so nice and everything now, but take a look at of what the Moro says about this. Yes, uh, it says we can be ecst ecstatic uh, to the profundity of the thought, like oh yes, we can be marvel of this eloquent words by Confucius and we can say hey yes we should speak less or not speak at all but then he comes with a really interesting perspective over here he says but we only know it because somebody wrote it and the wise Confucius could formulate it because he had words at his disposal without words nobody is nothing not wise neither poet so he's basically saying hey you know Confucius so nice such a nice man it's beautiful words and in your words uh, you are uh, underestimating the power of orality which is not yes because uh, for being able to say that you require words for being able to transmit the message uh, and, and for us to know it so many centuries after you said that uh, you require speak so it's 
sounds great as, 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 a, as a piece of poetry, but actually you are contradicting yourself in your own discourse. And that's it, yes, that is, that is why I put these uh, two quotes over here, uh, to try and make you realize, or reflect at least, about the, the importance of speaking and about the importance of having words, either written, oral, whatever, for now we're, we're focused on, on the oral discourse, but, um, well, definitely, um, language is something really important and our ability to communicate uh, orally, uh, especially in this, in this case, yeah, it's going to be paramount, right? So, um, let's take a look at some of the different uh, components or ideas or characteristics of orality, right? Um, apparently, this, this should be pretty obvious, no? We shouldn't even be speaking about it, like, because when is it oral? When is the discourse oral? Well, when you speak, that's it, period. Nevertheless, we have, we have a lot of different aspects that we need to revise, yes, because... Um, even though some parts of it are really obvious, well, some other ones generate some questions and and may they may be even blow our minds. Yes, if, if we analyze them somehow, right? So first of all, uh, it says in the slide number twenty-eight that it is usually natural. So normally, yes, usually under normal circumstances, we uh, produce oral discourse with our organs, no? With our body. Uh, so we normally use our tongue or, or our palate and uh, somehow our cavity or mouth cavity and everything else, our vocal cords. So everything everything that comes uh, naturally uh, equipped in our bodies uh, are usually the ones that propose, that, that uh, produce the oral, the oral modality. Yes? So here comes the first question yeah and think about them because i am not going to answer them in here maybe that will be part of some of the assignments okay so if that is oral modality uh, does it mean that when a machine speaks for us so think about i don't know stephen hawking writing his little computer with a robotic voice is that oral yes or no well think about that right um so we have this, and then we have some other things that are really interesting over here, yes? And is that uh, beyond uh, merely speaking, beyond our, our mere faculty of producing sounds with our mouth and vocal cords and etc., we have some other things that are also part of the oral modality, yes? Eye movement. So if I move the eye in order to denote attention or I open to, you know, sort of uh, surprise or if you know, sort of close a little bit to denote disbelief. I don't believe that much what you're saying, hmm. right? Facial expressions, body movements, like my hands that I'm all the time moving my hands, they are, are part of orality, yes? All of that, so our body language and, and let's say, uh, non-verbal, if you want to call it that way, uh, it's going to be also part of the oral modality. Yes, so uh, that is plus, yes, a little plus of, of what we normally have. Now, then, uh, even more, we go beyond, and uh, this slide tells us that non-linguistic vocal sounds and other noises are also part of, of oral communication. So, uh, sort of, of these expressions when I say, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Or when I show disbelief with, hmm. or, uh, you know, any other noise that you can think of, yes? That is not really, uh, let's say, uh, chained somehow or, or completely attached to, to the, the rules of grammar. Like, when we, when we study grammar, normally, hey, those things are not explained usually as, as, as a rule, no? Like we can have for present simple or past simple, or, uh, second conditional or whatever. Um, well, those are also part of the uh, of the oral modality, okay? 
then it says that it is usually simultaneous, right? So normally, normally uh, when you have a conversation, you are having it simultaneously or synchronically. Yes, uh, everybody is at the same time over there. So you and 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 let's say uh, the person that is receiving the message uh, that those have like really a. a, a um, a uh, definition or a concept or right now, like a specific name, such as the enunciator and the enunciate that we discussed uh, in the last in the last week. So, um, well, normally they are they are there, right? They are each other. They are able to respond to each other. They are able to um, receive the message and then reply or something like that. So, here comes the other question. So, what I'm doing right now with these videos? Is this auto communication? Because take into account that, right? I am producing these sounds with my, uh, let's say, natural organs, uh, with my, uh, let's say, what what, not, what nature has gifted with, uh, have gifted me, uh, the tongue, the vocal cords, everything else. I am doing these sounds all the time. I am moving my hands. I am having uh, facial expressions. All these different things, right? So does this count as oral modality, even if it's not simultaneous? Because well, maybe when I have my daughter moments, I ask questions to you guys, right? But I am not really receiving a, a, a an answer, and most of the times uh, it's not going to be simultaneous, not at all, right? Because this is recorded. I did it in the past. There's no way you're going to simultaneously answer. So think about that, right? Is this uh, Part of the oral modality or not? Okay, uh, then uh, let's say that there are, if you go to the slide number 29, we will see that there are some uh, communicative manifestations of orality that are not natural, and, and I use quotes in this strict sense. Yes, and I give like uh, three examples. Yes, a conference, a sermon, or a speech. An inaugural speech of a politician. I'm going to. They're going to inaugurate a hospital. Uh, uh, I don't know, a communal restaurant, uh, a bridge, whatever, right? So all of them, all of them have uh, somehow all of the characteristics. Yes, if you go to a conference, to a sermon, or to a to a speech. It is produced naturally, it uses body language, it uses maybe some sounds, depending on the formality of the of the of the event. Well, it uses all that, but it's not really that natural, no? For a conference, a sermon and a speech, you most of the times require to prepare your words. You have a script, yes, something written over there. Uh, sometimes there are interactions. For example, in a conference, there is a moment for questions. In a sermon, um, let's think about a church of any nature. Uh, sometimes there is, uh, I mean, you you can speak to your interlocutor, like they can ask questions or they can reply to whatever thing you say. Or there are some moments in during the ritual or the rite in which uh, the audience is supposed to say something or to reply something mm, during a speech. Well, mm, sometimes, uh, sometimes people may, may ask some questions at the end, or even if they don't, they may express their like or dislike. Right? They can clap, or maybe they can boo, or whatever. Mm, but there's some sort of way of communication, right? Nevertheless, uh, this involves uh, preparation, support, maybe if they ask some question you require to have another person that can help you with, with that, or simply take a look at your notes, memory of course, of course, uh, you require memory for that, because sometimes you, even when you're, um, when you're reading from, from a text, you require to know what comes first, what goes next, uh, how much, how long are you supposed to take, well, all these different things, and it requires writing, yes? So we will see that uh, writing, uh, writing is uh, a very important part 
of orality sometimes. Yes, sometimes in order to speak, you need to write. And this is exactly what happens to me with the never ending slides that I send you. Yes, so they are a hundred and I don't know how many. And I've been able to speak you right now fluently without reading most of the times, without reading the slides. Horrible thing, don't do that. Yeah. And your teachers, please don't do that. Um, so, um, because I was able to prepare in advance. Yes, so this uh, discourse, this oral discourse that I'm giving you since last week, that it's somehow natural because I am not planning. I, I am not planning every single word that I said or, or reading them. Well, uh, it is more or less fluent because of my preparation in writing. Okay. Very well, guys. Uh, so uh, here um, in the slide number thirty, we have uh, something related to uses of orality. Okay. So please, this is going to be our assignment number one in a very short way yes like you can use three sentences four sentences okay you are going to mention how orality can be used in these different fields i am going to take a look at the list and i'm going to assign you guys is one of these yes uh, and as i mentioned you're just going to describe in, in a few words uh, how orality can be used in these fields. We have politics, law, religious office, teaching, myths and legends, uh, traditional folk tales, jokes, songs, theater and cinema, right? Those are the ones. Uh, let's uh, make a couple of clarifications. I think that everything is clear. Uh, all of them are, are really evident except two of them myths and legends that is one single category so uh, a really short clarification uh, well these are all uh, fictional and fantastic stories uh, but they have like different uses myths normally explain the beginning of the word the origin of the world or the origin of any uh, behavior or phenomena or things like that yes so the Catholic myth of the creation of um, the universe is, uh, of course, with all due respect, because for some people this is not fantasy or, or, or unrealistic, but it's what they believe in. Yes. So this belief that it's uh, that can be transmitted as a myth is um, that God uh, created the earth in seven days, and and he created. Uh, at the beginning there was nothing yes only the the, the, the waters uh, and and then he started like creating different things right day by day so that is what the uh, catholic thing but then if we go to other mythologies or cosmogonies uh, such as the, the nordic or such as the mayan or such as the aztec well they have different things they involve uh, the body of a giant for example or they involve people uh, rising up from corn well there are different things right so those are myths that is how uh, we're going to call them foundational um, originary uh, somehow ways to explain the origin of the universe or the origin of a certain custom or habit yes now legends yeah, such as uh, let's take something local right such as patasola or madre monte or um, one yes uh, they normally are uh, local somehow uh, they apply to a to a particular region and usually they are um, real stories or partially real stories that has uh, a fantastic element and that normally is trying to take uh, uh, or to produce a moral or a reflection right so let's think about those three things uh, madre monte is trying to protect uh, somehow uh, nature and the forest and the mountain and everything else from the depredations of men yes so is this really powerful character who has the possibility of controlling uh, animals and nature and make you lost uh, uh, make you make you get lost if, if you are uh, 
you know, cutting maybe the trees or damaging nature somehow, right? Uh, we have this Patasola, for example, that in different versions was a woman who was unloyal or unfaithful to uh, her husband, and because of that, uh, he uh, cut uh, her leg with a machete, with a, an axe, there are different versions, and then she had to sort of uh, wander, uh, wander sorry, around the earth, and, and she is always attacking unfaithful husbands or unfaithful wives, right, like she, she pretends to be really nice and beautiful, and then she attacks them. Um, so, you see, there is a model over there in which it is bad, or it, if you're if you're unfaithful or unloyal to your partner to your uh, couple, uh, you may have like a bad consequence, right? So you see the difference. The first ones myths are foundational or originary. The second ones are more about behaviors uh, that are either promoted or condemned by society. Okay. Uh, so those are myths and legends and traditional folk tales. Yes, the folk tales. Well, remember that folk has to do with folklore. Um, well, they may explain certain things about uh, about uh, let's say characteristics or origins of uh, habits or customs or things like that. So, for example, uh, there is there is a folk tale. There are there are some folk tales uh, in, in Ireland about how. Uh, leprechauns have their pots of gold at the at the end of the rainbow, right? Does it explain the origin of anything in terms of something foundational, the universe? Not really, right? Does it uh, explain anything in terms of, uh, uh, um, let's say, a moral behavior that you're supposed to follow? Not really, right? So it's only about different, uh, let's say, customs or habits. Uh, let's say that there is another folk tale, a Native American, uh, that explains that, uh, I'm just very, you know, I'm going to summarize it a lot, explains how the crow was white, but then he was uh, doing many different trips and he uh, sort of contaminated himself or stained himself with ash from a, from a fire, and then... Uh, from, from that moment on, the crow, this animal that was originally white, became black. Yes, that was his color. So again, no, not, a, not really an explanation of the origin of the universe, or a town or whatever, not really an explanation of, of a moral thing, something that you shouldn't do, no, just sort of an explanation of a phenomena, or something like that, right? Anyway, if you look online, probably you can find some other definitions of traditional folk tales, okay? And basically that's it. So uh, please remember, you're going to do that. Uh, um, if you want, people with the same topic can work together if you want, okay? Uh, if you do it in that way, remember, I, I already mentioned that. Uh, both of you, or the three of you, um, require to upload the document uh, individually okay even if you three work together or four or whatever or two um, so remember to upload the document in the assignment you simply upload the same document but each one individually does that and that's it oh if you prefer to do it individually that's fine it's up to you okay so that will be our first assignment for this week so hopefully uh, well not really this will be the second sorry this will be the second assignment because the first is the one of the of the text um, that I explained uh, last week. So this will be the second assignment for the week and um, hopefully it, it is clear enough. Okay, so thank you very much and we will continue about uh, talking a little bit about orality in uh, our next video. Okay, thanks a lot. Hugs.